most famous and best known UFO case in the world, the UFO crash at Roswell in New Mexico. In 1993, a letter crossed my desk from a gentleman called Ray Santilli that would change things forever. He did go on to mention uh, that he had film of the Roswell UFO crash. Not only did he have some film footage of Roswell, but the actual aliens themselves being dissected, an alien autopsy. An alien autopsy is always going to be the subject of ridicule. Who's going to believe that an alien autopsy is an alien autopsy? It's just a ridiculous subject. I did get to the bottom of it. It just took me a lot longer than I expected. Interestingly, internal communications from the CIA have been released uh, where they're actually talking about alien autopsy back then and, and verifying that they, have, that, that they believe that the footage is real and they've seen it themselves. Perhaps in the desert of Roswell, New Mexico, in 1947, we had first contact with beings not of this earth. When I rather naively began my involvement, I expected to read a few books, ask a few questions, maybe write a few letters, and I'd have all the information I could ever dream of. I've certainly found some of those answers down the years, but by no means have I found them all. My name is Philip Mantle, and I've been involved in UFO research for 40 years. During that 40 years, you know, I've, I've, I've researched and investigated UFO cases of every description, really. Probably best known for my involvement in the alien autopsy film. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. The town of Roswell was in the middle of the desert in New Mexico, and its main employer was the Roswell Army Air Force Base that was nearby. 
And one night in, in early July, there was a, a lightning storm. And the next day, on a sheep rancher's property, a chap called Matt Brazel came out to inspect his sheep one day and found this wreckage across his land. The sheep wouldn't go anywhere near it. Uh, he'd never seen this, this type of material before. He didn't have a telephone. He didn't even have electricity on his ranch. So he took some of this material to his, his neighbour. I lived by the name of Loretta Proctor at a nearby ranch. And she advised him to take it into the town. She said it might be something to do with the military. So he waited a few days uh, until he had to go into town for something and he gathered some of this material up and took it to the sheriff. And that was Sheriff George Wilcox. Uh, again, Sheriff Wilcox had never seen anything like it, so we put in a phone call to the Roswell Army Air Force, uh, which seemed the obvious thing for him to do. I was called to headquarters, was given copies of a press release which stated in essence that we had in our possession a flying disc told to hand deliver to the uh, four news media we had in town at that time, two radio stations and two newspapers. That, of course, then went out on the wire service, the local radio covered it, and the story shot around the world. You know, the sheriff did say we're getting phone calls from, you know, all four corners of the globe. So that's how we got to know about it, not through uh, uh, any unofficial statement, but from an official press release. Within hours, in fact, the next newspaper the following day, they retracted that, said, sorry, big mistake. It was a weather balloon. The Roswell Army Air Force housed what is known as the 509th Bomb Group, and they were the only atomic bomb wing in the world. It was the 509th, for example, that dropped the atomic bombs on Japan to end the Second World War. So this wasn't some little, you know, air base stuck out in the middle of nowhere. It was a very important installation. It was a very different world than we have here today. There was very real fear that the US and the Soviet Union were heading for war and that that war would be a nuclear war. So there was still a great respect for officialdom, certainly in the military. Both the US and the USSR in, in opposite direction were keeping tabs on each other. Uh, we know that the atomic bomb was designed and invented in the United States. However, the secrets were leaked to the, uh, to the Soviets, so they did have uh, atomic bombs, uh, and the US were keeping a close eye on them the best they could. So tensions were very real uh, in 1947, and there were many that suspected that, that you know, war could well be imminent. Primarily, if the military said something was so-and-so, then you'd probably believe them. A lot of people in the town may have even served in the military at one point. The town depended on the airbase for its living you know, during those days. It certainly did have a, an, an effect. After the telephone call went to the airbase from the sheriff, they dispatched their intelligence officer, which was Lieutenant Jesse Marcel. He took with him a, a gentleman called Sheridan Cavett, and they made their way out to the Brazel Ranch and collected some of this material. And on the way back, Marcel stopped at his home. He didn't live on the base, they lived off base with his wife and his 11-year-old uh, son, Jesse Marcel Jr. When he came in, he was very excited. He woke my mother and myself up. It must have been 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning. And he wanted us to see what he was bringing in from the field. He said, this is parts of a flying saucer. And uh, it was all brought in and spread out on the kitchen floor. And uh, we just looked at it. Young Marcel picked up a, a rod about this long that looked 
edge on like a capital letter I. So it got the nickname of an I-beam. You know, I, I picked up this particular I-beam and held it up to my upper left to look at it with the kitchen light reflecting on the inner surface. And that's when I saw the, uh, the writing or the symbols of some sort. I thought at first, this is hieroglyphics or some kind of writing like that. It certainly looked alien to me. And his father said, son, you may be the first person to ever see writing from another world. He gathered the stuff up and took it back to the base. There are some people, even today, who say, well, you know, the military did make a mistake, and, and it was indeed simply a balloon, um, but attached to a secret project. Uh, hence, uh, you know, the reason for keeping it quiet. You go back to Major Marcel himself, they used to release weather balloons twice a day from the Air Force Base. He'd been trained in how to do this. He knew what a weather balloon looked like. And he said, that material that I posed for in his office was a weather balloon, but that wasn't the material that I picked up that day on the ranch. He claimed that there'd been a switch and he was told to keep quiet and say nothing. Why the cover-up was put into place is still hotly debated. But you have to remember, this is just after the Second World War, so people were used to keeping secrets, and the nature of the airbase itself, it was a, 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 a nuclear facility. So, you know, secrets were part of everyday routine. I sincerely believe we had the crash of something from outer space, because we still don't have materials that compare with the descriptions I've got of the material that was picked up out on the ranch and brought into town. He couldn't figure this out. There were some other bits and pieces, the likes of which he'd never seen before. This was the puzzling thing. They, 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 they had seen weather balloons and things of that nature, but nothing like this at all. I think at last count, I had spoken to around four dozen people who who handled various aspects of the debris. The most dramatic is the foil-like material that you could wad up in a ball and let it go and it would unfold itself. Matt Brazel, like Sheriff Wilcox and others, claimed that some of this material was almost, almost looked like tin foil, but it was very light. And when you, you rolled it up or crushed it in your hand and then let go again, it would immediately unfurl and go back to its original shape without any creases or bents or dints. And it got the nickname of memory metal. They tried to burn it and they couldn't burn it. It wouldn't catch on fire and they took out their pocket knives and they tried to cut it and they couldn't cut it. And I guess they all had their chance to play with it for a while and it was laying on the table so I reached over and picked it up. And I played for it probably about five minutes. When you would wad it up in your hand, you couldn't feel it in your hand. You couldn't feel you had anything there. And it would go to a size that was so small that you'd have to look to see if it was still in your hand. And then when you drop it, it spread out all over the table. Daddy came in so excited, and he said, what they saw was not from this world. There were two bodies that were laying on the ground outside of this craft and that there was one, what he called, little person. And he said, there's one little person that was walking around. And he said, they were still alive. And he said that the other two were dead and that this one that was alive was very sad. My dad would not have gotten excited over a weather balloon. He was not easily excitable. And this is the most thrilled I'd ever seen him in my life. He thought that was the most fantastic thing in the world. When you go back to Roswell and look at the, the various eyewitnesses, not many of them stepped forward at that time in 1947, uh, simply because there was no avenue for them to do so. It wasn't until some years later, when in the late 1970s, nuclear physicist and UFO researcher Stanton Friedman met Colonel Marcel. He was in retirement now. And he was introduced to him by a TV station who knew about his story. Then the word got out. Roswell became 
news. It was featured in television and newspapers and so on. And it's only when that happened then other people who were there at the time stepped forward. Some went on the record, others, you know, in confidence. Some were also found by UFO researchers. They look who was serving in the military at the airbase at that time and, and were able to track them down and find them. So many of the airmen and civilian witnesses as well went on the record. So the investigation to Roswell started in earnest in the late 1970s uh, and it's still ongoing even today. There's been lots of first-hand witnesses from the military go on the record. Even young Marcel himself, he became a doctor, a medical doctor and a flight surgeon, served in the military himself. He's gone on the record, wrote his own book about it, spoke at conferences. Sadly, he's no longer with us. Um, so a lot of the people who were there are the first or second hand step forward. There is this threatening aspect of, of the Roswell story, but again, we have to remember it, it was a different era and a di different time. So there were those, certainly in the military, if they were told to keep quiet, then they would do exactly that. That was their duty and that's the way they were trained and that's the way that they acted. A number of the military witnesses didn't go on the record for a long time, perhaps when they were in the twilight of their own life and they thought, well, if I don't say something now, then I, I'll never have the opportunity. Uh, and that seems to be in the case in, you know, on a number of occasions. The best evidence we have from a number of eyewitness sources is that the craft and the bodies were brought to Hangar 84 on the Roswell Army Airfield and stored overnight before transport. What we understand from the eyewitness testimony is the bodies were sealed in a large wooden crate uh, kept at the center of the hangar. It's absolutely brilliant what they did. They, they announced they have a flying saucer, but they've already captured it. They've already got it. There's nothing to see, so nobody goes out looking for the thing. Then they shift everything to Fort Worth. The higher headquarters says, no, no, those guys made a mistake. It was just a weather balloon. One of the silliest of things about the Roswell affair is that there are claims that the military not only ordered the people under their command to stay quiet, but also civilian witnesses. The press can't find Jesse Marcel because he's in Fort Worth and he's been silenced. You know, when he came back from Carswell after flying the debris, he did tell me not to talk about this, told my mother not to talk about this. This is a non-event. Play like it never happened. Don't even talk about this with your friends, which I didn't. And uh, he, years later, he confided that he was actually part of the cover-up because he uh, went along with the Air Force explanation, even though he knew full well that that was not true. There's corroborative testimony that suggests somebody was putting pressure on people to silence them and they used what means were necessary to keep those people silent. With some of the civilians, it was, they were told that if you ever talk about it, you will be killed. For example, there's a lady by the name of Frankie Rowe. Her father was a firefighter. He's claimed that they were dispatched to the event and he managed to somehow acquire a piece of this memory metal and show it to her. You know, she was his daughter. Shortly afterward, they were visited by members of the military. Uh, with a stern warning, and I mean a very stern warning, that keep quiet about this and say nothing. You know, bullets are cheap, so to speak. I said, yes, I did handle it. And he started emphasizing, no, you didn't. Well, my mother was pretty strict, and we didn't lie. So I'm insistent that, yes, I saw it, yes, I held it. And he got mad, and he got louder, and he had one of those, looks like a small baseball bat that hooks on the side of your belt, and he took that out. And he's holding it, and he starts beating his hand. Every time he said something, he would hit that on his hand. And he would say, I want you to understand, you were never there. You did not see anything. You did not hear a conversation. And he said, if you can't understand this, there are things that we can do. He said, we could take you out here in the middle of this desert. He said, this is a big desert here. He said, no one will ever find your bodies. 
ever. No one will ever know what happened to you. He said, the only way I'm going to let you stay around or live is if you promise you'll never talk about this the rest of your life. So I told him I wouldn't. And that was a reoccurring theme every now and again, both with civilian and military witnesses. The wreckage at the time, uh, and he even says this in the, in the newspaper cuttings, was flown to Wright Field as it was called, and it's now called Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Still in operation, and it's claimed that that is where the wreckage and possibly even the, the, the bodies were studied, officially studied. Uh, and it was in a, a mythical, almost mythical hangar, given the number of Hangar 18. There are those that claim that when the wreckage was studied at Wright Patterson Air Force Base. It was drip fed secretly into civilian research programs. And that it may have helped the technology for the space race, for example. Good Lord, ride all the way. Give Godspeed, John Glenn. Bye. Silicon chips fiber optics, and eventually all the way through to the stealth technology that we see in the aircraft. That is a rumor, it's not proven, but uh, there are those that say that, you know, most of the technology that was found that day at Roswell are still yet to be identified, and we haven't been able to reverse engineer it at all. The story got a new lease of life, uh, certainly in the 1980s. Stanton Friedman, sadly no longer with us, but he was the main civilian researcher of the Roswell incident. And he had no doubt, no doubt whatsoever, that this was a crash of a vehicle uh, that was not of this earth, and that a cover-up was put in place almost immediately one that is still intact today. And I think it was Stanton who coined the phrase the cosmic Watergate. So he had no doubt that A, it was an alien vehicle, and B, there's a cover-up. How about the analysis of the materials? How about the autopsy reports? How about the eyewitness testimony from those who stood guard, those who carried it, those who tested at various government labs? There ought to be a ton of other paper. Stanton was a, a diligent researcher and he would track down and interview witnesses to the event. He was also one of those that would be quite happy to spend days uh, researching through government archives to find documentation of one form or another. And he was literally, one, once he got his teeth into something, he was like a dog with a bone. And he did uncover a number of witnesses. He interviewed just about anybody and everybody. But what he also did was help spread the word. You know, he was the man that actually put Roswell on the map. And gradually, you know, the UFO story w was, was out there for all of us to digest. Roswell, the town itself is, is still thriving. The, the Air Force Base closed many years back. Back in the 1980s, some documents known as Majestic 12 or Magic 12 were leaked. And it mentioned here that, you know, the bodies and other things were studied at a secret base. And, and of course, put two and two together, and that secret base is, is alleged to be Area 51. I was the press officer for the British UFO Research Association. And in 1993, a, a letter across my desk that would change things forever. And it was a letter from the Merlin Group in London from a gentleman called Ray Santilli. 
after the initial letter, uh, we corresponded some more, and I spoke to Ray Santilli on the telephone. It was quite apparent he knew very little about the UFO subject. So I arranged to meet Ray Santilli in London, obviously a businessman. Music was his main area of business. He, he, he obviously knew about that. However, he did go on to mention uh, that he had film of the Roswell UFO crash. Not only did he have some film footage of Roswell, but the actual aliens themselves being dissected, an alien autopsy. The story from that point on became quite a roller coaster. At the time, you know, I didn't look upon it as being anything other than just a film. You have to ask yourself, OK, we have a film. What could it be? First of all, could it be a hoax? Of course it could, you know. When you look at the movie Jurassic Park, they made full-size dinosaurs, you know, move and look real. So with enough time and money, yes, it could be a hoax. Then we looked at, could it be real? Could it really be, you know, from Roswell? Like I said, it had always been rumoured that film and still photographs were taken. There was also another idea that perhaps this was some kind of poor, deformed human being that we were looking at. So it was, again, a real film, but it was of some, uh, you know, some deformed person. And there was even a, another theory, if you like, that could this be some US military disinformation film? Not to disinform UFO researchers, perhaps it was made to fool the Soviets, you know, and, and leak it in, into the Soviet Union to say, look what we've got. So there was a number of ideas, you, you know, as to what it may or may not be, none of which could be proven one way or another at that point. I spent in total 14 years researching the alien autopsy film. And in 2006, we'd already been given a name, a first name of a gentleman, and the name was Spiros. I knew the film was a fake, I just couldn't prove it. I had a few missing pieces. A colleague of mine called Russell Callahan had a phone call from a gentleman called Spiros Malaris. And he said, Russell said, it's not me you want to speak to, it's Philip. Bang, there was our mysterious man we'd been looking for. And as soon as I spoke to him, he just filled in all the gaps. Game over. Spiros. Um, Spiros Milaris is a very talented and very interesting and creative filmmaker. I used Spiros on Alien Autopsy when we did The Investigation Continues, which was a 60-minute docu documentary based on everything that happened at Roswell. Um, so he was quite involved in, in um, most parts of the, the, the project. And, um, you know, I, I know that there's, you know, some difficulty at the moment because he's, he's laying claim to coming up with the entire concept of alien autopsy and, and, and doing everything, but that's absolutely not true. And he was not involved um, in our trip in America, finding the cameraman, bringing the footage over, and all of that part of it. All the questions we'd be, I'd been asking for years, here an answer for all of them. It's like having a jigsaw puzzle with bits missing. And, and you had a good idea what the jigsaw was, but once you got the missing parts, it just, that was it. Finished.
At some point in the 2000s, I was contacted by a gentleman who claimed to have some information about it. So I met him and he said, I'm a good friend of a, a sculptor here in the UK. Wouldn't tell me the sculptor's name. However, before he left the meeting, he let slip one of the projects this sculptor was responsible for. And it was a Channel 4 re recreation some years prior called Max Headroom, which was quite popular. So we checked out who this gentleman was, and he was indeed a UK sculptor, and he was called John Humphreys. John Humphreys is um, one of the best makers in terms of prosthetics. So he's a sculptor, he's, a, he's an artist, he's a creative. Spiros, then and now, went on to tell me that he'd heard uh, Ray Santilli's story about, you know, meeting this fake cameraman and, and so on. He'd met Ray by chance at a, a film festival in France, contacted him again when he came back to the UK. Ray Santilli showed Spiros a piece of film. Uh, Spiros said, that's never been filmed on celluloid, it's, it's VHS. So Ray told him this fake story about the cameraman and him paying for this footage. So he, he, he took off to drive home, did uh, Spiros. And he had this idea, he, he phoned a friend of his, which was the sculptor, John Humphreys, and told him about this story and they said, why don't we make him one? I.e., why don't we make him an alien autopsy film? So Spiros went back to Ray and said, if you want an alien autopsy film, you know, we can make it for you. Simple as that. Well, I think Ray Santilli's reaction was, you know, a, a light bulb moment. It was just a question of the financing. And uh, they had a, a, a gentleman who, who could provide that finance. So, you know, the game was afoot. I've been involved in looking at Roswell probably from about 1993. Everybody knows a bit about Roswell, and the reason we're talking about it again is because of the alien autopsy. Interestingly, internal communications from the CIA have been released uh, where they're actually talking about alien autopsy back then and, and verifying that they, have, that, that they believe that the footage is real and they've seen it themselves. And it has been called the Alien Autopsy Memo. It is a string of emails between a chap called Eric Davis and Dr. Kit Green. On this 11 page document, they are evaluating a number of things on which they were working on. But primarily, it is the alien autopsy film they're discussing. It's addressed to US billionaire Bob Bigelow, who used to run an organization called the National Institute for Discovery Science, NIDS, and he employed a number of scientists to study UFOs. One of those scientists is, is Dr. Kit Green. Kit Green formerly worked for the CIA. This email list is clarifying uh, statements made by Kit Green concerning the alien autopsy film. It's dated 2001. Without going into in too great a detail, he came to the conclusion, as did the, the others copied in on these emails, that the alien autopsy film, in his opinion, was real, and that he'd some, seen exactly the same type of film at a briefing at the Pentagon back in 1987, stroke 88. And it's caused quite an uproar yet again. When you look at the consensus of UFO researchers around the world when it comes to these documents uh, and it's like, oh no, not the alien autopsy again. I thought we'd done that. I thought we'd proved it's a fake. Let's move on. 
You know, let's forget about it, please. The, the leaked documents were sent to me by three different individuals the day before they were released online. I had no idea this was about to happen, but it just did. It is believed it has come from an archive of a well-known gentleman who had passed away. I'll not mention his name because it's not yet been verified. But it seems plausible enough. He was involved in UFO research. He's an extremely well-known gentleman, if I mention his name. Okay, he's Houston, the computer shows. Thank you, you troops did a nice job down there. That was beautiful. Auto. We're on the surface. Four minutes later, he was joined by Ed Mitchell. There's a number of people who are copied in on this email. And one of those who was copied in, I emailed them and asked them if the documents in question were authentic. And he said, off the record, Philip, yes, they are. The gentleman I contacted on email has refused to answer any more questions. And it would appear to me that both him and his colleagues who are mentioned in this document are embarrassed because this was an internal set of emails uh, and was never meant for public consumption. The only person so far to speak to Kit Green about this is, uh, is US uh, researcher Richard Dolan. You know, Richard has interviewed him on the telephone. Uh, I think one of the first things he asked him was, is this email list, is it authentic? Uh, and he said, yes, it is. Another chap who worked for Robert Bigelow was a chap called Colm Kelleher. And he contacted me and he asked me to speak with, with Ray Santilli for him. What Colm was, was seeking at the time was a good quality copy of the alien autopsy film and of course some celluloid some 16 millimeter film to analyze so i did like i'd done many times before put him in touch with sam Tilly and and left them to it the main gentleman mentioned in these documents who was commenting on the alien autopsy film is a gentleman called christopher kit green Everyone knows him as Kit Green. He's an MD, he's a PhD, and still practices medicine even now in the United States. Dr. Green, at one point, was employed by the CIA, worked on a number of projects for them in a variety of capacities. So he's, he's a, you know, a highly intelligent gentleman and, and one that's very well qualified as well. He claims that the briefing he was given in 1988-87 stroke was specifically about the alien autopsy. I think the main reason when you look at these documents is why they would want Kit Green to evaluate the alien autopsy film. There are two reasons. One is that in 1988 stroke 87, Kit Green himself says he was taken to the Pentagon and briefed and shown films that looked exactly the same as the alien autopsy film. But also, he's an MD, he's a medical doctor. So later in these documents, Dr. Kit Green, looking at the alien autopsy film itself, nothing to do with any briefing he'd had at the Pentagon, but he gives his own medical opinion on what he sees on that film. And he says, I think it's real. It's a genuine article. Uh, field of expertise do these people have? dealing with anatomies of 
uh, alien beings. I assure you, none. We were learning. That was day one of school when they first cut into the first specimen. One time, there was a requirement for our OIC to go to, to Fort Belvoir, Virginia. So I went ahead and I was selected as the driver to take him to Fort Belvoir, Virginia. After we arrived there, he went to where the officers were meeting for a briefing. The drivers went to another location. There was myself and an, an airman first class, and we went inside to the balcony area, which had a, a text and glass cover over where we, where we could look down to where the officers were. When we looked down there, we found that they were watching films. We were watching and thinking, well, it has to be some type of uh, science fiction movies that they're watching, where they're splicing them together like uh, trailers at the end of a movie. We couldn't figure out what type of movies they were. So while we were talking amongst ourselves, we looked around, we had two gentlemen come in and told us we were to follow them. The airman and myself thought we were in trouble because we'd seen all these officers being brought together with taxpayers' money, watching what we perceived to be uh, little clips from science fiction movies. Because I honestly didn't think that we would ever be in a position where I could be so easily exposed to something like that. However, after four days and five nights of that, I went ahead and finally convinced them that I wouldn't be discussing this situation. The interesting thing I found out when I first saw the films, the uh, films of the dissection, the word that I used to describe what I saw was haunting, and it had a special significance to me, because I was seeing images of what I saw in 1969. That brought back specific memories. What happened to me is what they call intensified debriefing. And I can tell you this much, intensified debriefing, you'll go ahead and you'll take sleep over food. You'll get water, because see, it's important you have water, or you'll die. So they'll provide you with food. But you slept in spurts. You'd go and lay your head down on the pillow. You'd go into what they call deep sleep. That's about three to five minutes, and you'd be woken up, and you'd be taken back, put under the lamps again for more intensified debriefing. And what they'd do, they knew that you were wondering what was going to happen to you. So it had an effect on you. And that's about the gist of it. Forgive me. Is Kit Green saying that the things he saw in the 1980s were similar or the same as the being in the 1995 Santilli film? He emphasizes it and actually spells it out in capital letters and says they are the same. Not similar, but the same. And of course, that's simply not possible. There are those that think that perhaps, you know, Ray Santilli is not behind the invention of the alien autopsy film, nor is Spiros Milaris, but instead, for some mysterious reason, it's the CIA. There are a number of well-known UFO researchers, primarily in the United States, can't believe that someone of Kit Green's experience and standing would be fooled by a fake film. So there must be something more to it. And uh, they believe that he was indeed shown other films, fake or real, by the CIA, that look either the same or similar to the Santilli film. Therefore, the CIA must, in some mysterious way, be linked to the faking of it. I can't see any sense in that at all and don't believe a word of it. It is alleged that the CIA have fed false stories 
about UFOs uh, into the public domain for a variety of reasons. We do know for a fact that they did feed fake UFO sightings into the public domain to cover up overflights of this, their own spy plane. So they may have other reasons for putting fake alien stories into the public domain. If we jump back to Roswell, for example, some people claim that the alien aspect of it is a fake story to cover up what really did happen. But this is only speculation. Here you've got a scientist and a medical doctor being fed information by the CIA. Dr. Kit Green, who has now been interviewed by Richard Dolan, has changed his attitude somewhat. He believes now the film is a fake. And he says that the CIA lied to him back in the 80s. However, he does now still say that some of the film that he saw at the Pentagon, some of the aspects of it, like the creature's face and the hand and the room, were still the same as the Santilli film released in 1995. Now, whether it's the whole film or bits of it, they cannot be the same because the film was only designed and made in 1995. So nothing in it can be the same as something seen back in the 1980s. It is simply not possible. When Kit Green does his evaluation, he notices a few small mistakes in the medical procedure, but then you know, he has an explanation of, of for why these mistakes may have been made, because it was back in 1947, they didn't do things the same then as they do now, and so it was the military, you know, and, and they had different ways of doing things. He speculates that if any tissue samples were taken, they would go to the Walter Reed Institution, which of course is based at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, which we have mentioned before, and it's links with UFO research. Although he's only speculating, he, he doesn't know this for sure, it's just pure speculation at that point. When you look at Dr. Kit Green's evaluation of the, the, the alien autopsy film, he doesn't get anything right and you think to yourself is he looking at the same film as me because he mentions various medical items in it which you can't see you know they're just not there so it, it does make you wonder how he's come to these conclusions i've tried to get in touch with mr green to ask him a few questions the first one i would ask is how did a man of your reputation and experience come to be fooled by this fake film that would be my first question but unfortunately, I've not had that, uh, that chance yet. There's, there's a number of things that are important about the memo. It shows you how someone with the knowledge and experience of Dr. Kit Green can be fooled by a piece of film. He wasn't alone. At the time when the film was released around the world, there were a number of physicians who went on the record saying it looks pretty authentic as far as the medical procedure is concerned. However, they wouldn't comment on what the creature on the slab was. He's gone that one step further. So it just shows you the impact that this film had, not just when it was released, but, you know, down the decades and still does continue to have uh, such an impact. I think the biggest revelation is that just when you think you've heard everything there is to hear about the alien autopsy film, and I have a huge archive of material on it, that something else appears and brings it back into the public domain again, and the argument starts from scratch. It was almost as if the 14 years I spent investigating it had been a complete waste of time. <laughs> <laughs> what is amazing is that Ray Santilli had been quiet for quite a while, but once this email document leaked, he was back on 
social media saying I always knew that there were documents somewhere that would prove that what I'd been saying was correct all along. He's even done a couple of interviews on a couple of podcasts still saying, yeah, I told you I had real film, I told you there was a mysterious cameraman. Well, he, you know, these documents don't prove anything, but he's using it to the best effect. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. Army officers say the missile, found sometime last week, has been inspected at Roswell, New Mexico, and sent to Wright Field, Ohio, for further inspection. It's the one case that will not die. It is claimed that not only a UFO crashed, but there were dead alien bodies. It's rumored that perhaps one of those creatures on board did survive for a short period of time. It's the case that will not die. It is shrouded in mystery. And even now, all those that, that were at Roswell or, or saw something around the time have all passed away. However, information still comes to light. It's lying in somebody's files or in a cupboard or, you know, in the attic in a box. You know, just when you think you've heard everything there is to know about Roswell, something pops up and bites you on the backside. It really does.